Uh, my name is uh, Yano Mossman, and I was a friend of Jim's for, I guess it would be 23 years, um, and was his best friend. My hope right now is I can, you know, get through my little piece without, well, I hope I can just get through it. Um, I knew Jim, that he was not a spiritual, well, he wasn't a religious person, and, uh, you know, the, um, the closest he came to spirituality was he believed in some kind of a higher power because that's how he got sober. And that's where I met him, uh, was in AA, and he was my first, one of my first sponsors, and it helped me get sober. And we, over the years, helped each other. You know, we became kind of co-sponsors of each other, kept each other on the straight and narrow, as far as sobriety was concerned. But, uh, so, I'm, he made me the executor of his will and, you know, had me carry out whatever I wanted to do. He said that as far as the service was concerned, you know, obviously he wasn't going to know or care, and, but he realized that people that loved him and knew him would want some kind of a ceremony to uh, mark his passing, and so he, uh, the only request he made is he, he'd be laid out in this purple cashmere blazer, and anybody that knew him knows that uh, he was the purpler, so uh, that's, that's very appropriate. Um, it's nice to see a bunch of people from his work, and that's, you know, there were almost two different gyms that I knew, and one of them was, um, uh, you know, I, I knew him before he was in uh, medical school. I knew him when he was uh, working, um, he used to call it snake wrestling, and he worked for a guy that did gunite swimming pools, and, you know, he would uh, hold the, the hose and shoot the gunite out of it onto, like, a form, and you know, laugh it in, and you know, he'd show up for AA meetings, be all covered in like cement dust and everything. And but he was that's the most physically fit I ever knew him from like snake wrestling with that concrete hose all day long, and you know, put him in good shape. But I remember him, him going through medical school, and uh, uh, and he he looked back on that as the good old days when you know he had a very little money and lived in a real modest apartment and would have to take the bus to school. and uh, and work too. And I remember him working at uh, uh, Starker's restaurant down in the plaza. And um, uh, but just the whole progress of him going through school and getting his degree, and and then uh, starting to work in different hospitals around town. And I saw that once he started to work, he was just completely devoted to what he did. And he was. Um, I've told the story a couple of times here today that. Uh, when I met him in AA, he had a satchel that he carried around with every book that Bill Wilson and uh, Bob Smith ever uh, uh, published and uh, basically knew the rules and regulations, which, I mean, the reason AA works is it's so loosely organized. But um, he was a stickler for uh, detail and for, uh, you know, knowledge about whatever it was that he was doing in, in nursing. He really excelled at that. and. Um, so, I mean, I, he was too professional to violate any kind of confidentiality or anything with me as far as names and dates and so forth, but he would, you know, tell me some stories of, you know, from work and things that he'd experienced and so forth, and I could tell that he was, uh, would be a really great person to be on a shift with, that he was, you know, uh, a real take care of business kind of guy. And then in his personal life, but he was, he was almost completely different, where he was, you know, kind of focused and... Uh, very um, uh, empathetic uh, on the uh, work side. He was he could let down his hair with me and be himself. And um, sometimes he was you know blunt and uh, uh, you know could be um, not the easiest person to be around. Let's put it that way. But you know throughout the years we had enough in common that we uh, uh, enjoyed each other's company continually and, and uh, you know right up to the end and right. Um, right before I left, I was on vacation in Canada when uh, he chose to exit, and um, I think he knew that. And um, uh, I was with him the last three days before I left because I know he'd taken time off from work, and so we spent three days together. Of, you know, I think we went on a bike ride and we watched a movie and went out to dinner and just hung out together. And, you know, we're very comfortable and we were making plans for things to do when I got back so you know I thought you know he had 
hinted to me before that he might uh, end his life at some time. And when I talked to his family, I found out that that was not news to them, that they, you know, he had been uh, talking about that for a long, long time. And um, anyhow, but it was a shock and a, uh, just a terrible loss for me and everyone that knew him that uh, this is, you know, as much as he could bear and, you know, when he, this is when he chose to, to exit. So, uh, but, you know, the, the form here is for people to get up and share uh, gym stories, uh, good or bad, whatever. It's kind of an open mic and I encourage everyone to, uh, because to me we're, we're uh, videotaping this and uh, so as far as I'm concerned, the way Jim will live on is in our hearts and in our spirit. And um, so, you know, I'm here to kind of share the love and to celebrate, uh, you know, the great parts of, and, and whatever, the whole totality of Jim Wright Jr. So I don't know who wants to be first, but uh, uh, I'd invite someone to come up and, and share their uh, little bit of Jim with us. And then, you know, uh, Jim's father would like to speak last, but he's uh, knows he probably won't be able to, you know, to get up here and say anything without being overcome with emotion. So he's asked his brother, Walt, to close out the service. So we have plenty of time. You know, they're not going to throw us out of here until 5 o'clock, so you can ramble on as much as you like. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like I'm going to close, actually, my little bit with... I didn't plan anything to say. I just figured I would, uh, you know, speak from the heart, get up here, and talk about my relationship with him. Um, but, um, you know, people, you know, as far as uh, my loss and so forth, I, I, my life will never be the same. I know that, and I know that uh, <clears throat> the real, the reality of the situation won't set in for some time because, you know, it's all the things that I would ordinarily think of him that I'm going to talk to him about or show him or share with him or something. Um, you know, he physically won't be there for me to do that with. So that will be a, a big hole in my life. So anyhow, well, if I, if I feel like coming up and saying something else, I will. But anyhow, can I get a, can I get a volunteer? Can I get a witness, I guess, as they say? <laughs> How about, and a, a, a number of people from work, that they work at Shawnee Mission Medical Center came, and uh, I really appreciate that, as I'm sure his family does. And so how about somebody from work? Can I get someone that worked with him to come up and say a few words about working with Jim? And this is Phil? Fred. Fred, excuse me. And this is uh, Jim's, uh, uh, ran the unit that Jim worked in, so. Yeah, I'm Fred Zang, um, and I uh, am the director of the unit where Jim worked. And uh, I'm not a nurse, but uh, I had the privilege, actually, of uh, doing two of Jim's annual evaluations. And uh, uh, we didn't have a nurse manager at the time, and so that became kind of my responsibility. But it was um, really a very um, um, great way for me to get to know who Jim was because um, Jim had a great deal of empathy for mentally ill people. And um, it became evident in just how he spoke about his responsibilities um, on the unit, his work responsibilities, and his advocacy for mentally ill people. He, he understood and had a great deal of empathy for the suffering that mentally ill people um, experience. And um, really, every time I met with him, I felt um, a, a great deal of pride in having uh, that kind of dedication. Uh, 
uh, because uh, I knew it really takes that kind of person to make a difference. So um, when I came in today and I read uh, the uh, passage from Les Miserables, I, uh, uh, it made sense to me uh, in who I had learned who Jim was. Uh, someone who had um, understanding and empathy for people who suffer. And uh, uh, it was a privilege for me to know Joe. My name is Mark Kramer, and uh, Jimmy and I were uh, good buddies when we were kids and drifted apart through high school and on. But I, I think I owe it to everybody in this room to tell them, um, fifth grade, first time I met him, he tried out for football. And uh, he was this little butterball guy, Jeff, you knew him then, you remember. I don't know. He was he was clearly as tall as he was wide. He could not run a lap around our football field at Sequoia Elementary. He played nose guard for our football team and was the most aggressive, quickest, had the best feet you can ever imagine. Unbelievable. So when uh, you talk about dedication and knowing everything, he, he was just incredible. Uh, tremendous baseball player. We played. I think even a little soccer together, and um, I had the uh, opportunity to go on some family vacations to North Carolina, back to Big Jim's hometown, and it was uh, it was quite a treat. Um, I can't speak to him. Um, recently, last time I saw him was two summers ago when we went to see my father, and uh, I'm sorry that uh, we lost touch, um, but Jimmy was a great guy and uh, loved his music, and uh, certainly loved the purple. Um, and the Minnesota Vikings, which I'm assuming is where that came from. Uh, but um, he'll be missed, and uh, I'm sorry that we all have to go through this with uh, about a, a true friend that we've, we've had for years. <clears throat> 